Hello and welcome to another edition of Be Still My Soul. It is wonderful to be back. I really enjoyed doing it last week and it is wonderful for me personally to be looking at the Psalms and I hope it is a comfort and a, a help to you as well in your walk with God. We're looking at Psalm 2 today, which along with Psalm 1, introduces the, the, the Psalter. They were both written as an introduction together. And there's lots of overlap between the Psalms. Psalm 2 is about two things, or tells us two main things. It tells us that life is war, and it tells us that Jesus wins. Life is war, and Jesus wins. It tells us that through four word pictures. Uh, the Psalm is broken up into these four word pictures, which, which describe and the world in which we live. We see the nations raging, the Lord laughing, the sun proclaiming, and the psalmist warning. So four things, the nations raging, the Lord laughing, the sun proclaiming, and the psalmist warning. First of all, the nations raging. Why do the nations rage, says the psalmist, and the peoples plot in vain? The psalmist pictures the world, he looks at the world and pictures it as a huge battlefield with people in that battlefield raging and being angry at God. And why are they angry? They're angry. The kings of the earth set themselves, verse 2, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. They're angry because of God's cords, God's bonds. Cords and bonds are symbols of God's government, his law, his commandments. You see, this is a picture of what happens actually in every human heart. We naturally want to rebel against God. We don't like being told what to do. We want to be the boss of our own lives. And make our own decisions and say, I know best for me. I don't want God to be king over my life. And so we rage against him. That's the natural response of every human heart. But then we see, secondly, the Lord laughing. He who sits in the heavens, we're told, laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Instead of looking at the world... David now uh, lifts us above the world into heaven, into God's throne room, and we see God laughing. Not kind of a, 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 a jokey laugh, but a, 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 a serious laugh. A laugh that says, it is futile to rebel against your creator. You see, naturally speaking, we all want to rebel against God, but it's foolish. It's silly because God is God and we were made by him and for him. One person put it like this. The Lord's throne remains unshaken by all that human animosity can do. After man's intellect has invented its most brilliant assaults. And after all the force and energy of all human creatures who ever have lived or will live have been combined into a single thrust against God and his Messiah, God is unchanged, untouched, unharmed, unhindered in his person, his position and his plan. You know, can, can a tank be attacked with pea shooters or a fighter plane? with water bombs. See, see, the thought is, is ridiculous. It's laughable. How much more laughable and ridiculous is it for us in our hearts and for people in the world to fight against God? There's only one winner. That's why he says, then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury. It's ridiculous to fight against God. And what terrifies the nations that the psalmist looks at so much 
Well, this is the terrifying thing. As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. See, God's king reigns and will continue to reign. And so rebelling against him is ridiculous. But there's a third thing we see, and that is the son proclaiming. This one, this word picture also takes place in the throne room of heaven. But we're no, looking, no longer looking at the Lord, at God, but a new figure has appeared in heaven and it's God's anointed one, his Messiah, his reigning and ruling king. And we know him to be Jesus Christ himself. And this word picture begins with the son speaking. He looks back to his enthronement, his coronation service, and proclaims publicly to the world what God himself has actually said to him. And he tells us three things. First of all, verse seven, I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. The term son there doesn't mean DNA. It refers to his legal relationship with God. The kings of the Old Testament were sons of God because they were in God's place, ruling God's people. And that's what Jesus Christ is doing. He is God's king, sitting on God's throne, governing the universe. But second, he tells us in verse 8, Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. God has promised Jesus that his kingdom will be great. It will include all the nations of the world. The term nations here refers to Gentiles. It's not just the Jews who will be God's people. It will be Gentiles as well. And this kingdom will extend to the ends of the earth. It will include people from every nation, every people group, every tribe, every tongue. As we sometimes sing in church, Jesus shall reign wherever the sun does his successive journeys run. His kingdom shall stretch from shore to shore till moon shall wax and wane no more. You see, God's kingdom is going to grow to the ends of the earth. And we know that will happen because Jesus Christ died on the cross. And when he died on the cross, he died for people from every nation and people group and tribe and tongue to forgive their sins, to forgive our rebellion against him and to bring us back into relationship with God again, to bring us back into God's kingdom, a kingdom which will have no end, to save us from sin, to save us from death, to save us from destruction, that we might live on this new world, in this new kingdom forever. And we know it's going to happen because Jesus Christ has done pay for it on the cross. And we know it's going to happen because he has all the power to apply what he accomplished on the cross here and now. That's what he tells us thirdly in verse 9. God said to Jesus, you shall break them, the nations, with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. All the nations that oppose the rule of Jesus Christ, all the kings, all the rulers, all the people, he will dash in pieces like pottery. If somebody takes their stand against Jesus Christ, they will be like a royal Dalton figure standing before an oncoming tank. The tank is coming and soon the pieces will be irreparable. But finally, the fourth word picture, and that is of the psalmist warning. And this fourth word picture also takes place in heaven, uh, but there's another speaker now. We've had God speaking, we've had the Son speaking, and now the psalmist himself is speaking and reflecting on what he has seen. He's, he's as he were standing at the entrance of the judgment hall of Jesus Christ, and he says this, Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. He is giving a warning to the nations of the, the perilous state that anybody is in if they rebel against Jesus Christ. And he makes a plea. He's pleading with the kings. He's pleading with the rulers. He's pleading with you and me not to foolishly rage against Jesus Christ. He's warning us to flee from the oncoming tank, to flee from the wrath to come. And then he continues in verse 11, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. He wants us, instead of re rebelling against Jesus Christ, to submit to him. 
to, to, to put our trust in him. The word, uh, we, he wants us to rejoice in what Jesus Christ has done for us, forgiving us. He wants us to know what it is to be part of his kingdom, a kingdom that will have no end, a kingdom of peace and joy and love and harmony forever and forever. And how do we become part of that? He says in verse 12, kiss the son. That is worship Jesus Christ. Turn away from our rebellion and put our trust in him. But if we don't, there is danger. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. The tank is coming. We need to get out of the way. And the only way we can get out of the way of the, of the oncoming tank, the only way we can be safe from the destruction of the tank is by getting into the tank. The kings of the nations, all who rebel against Jesus Christ, are like royal, royal Dalton figurines standing before an oncoming tank. They're going to be crushed to powder. But there is safety. There is a refuge from the oncoming tank and the only safe place for royal Dalton figurines is actually inside the tank itself. Get into the tank and you will be safe and you will have a refuge and that refuge will be Jesus Christ. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his reign will know no end. Have you taken your refuge in Jesus Christ? Thank you so much for listening. God bless and good night.